So this is part two of a video that uh, explores the spectrum of pulse width modulation. In part one, we got to the point where we had computed the following, or the spectrum that's on the screen, for a pulse width modulated sine wave. And in this video, we'll talk a little bit about how to, um, how to reconstruct our original signal. Um, and it turns out that this is a useful exercise in terms of thinking about things in the frequency domain. So if I go back to my drawing here, um, and uh, let's uh, actually just clear this. And uh, if you'll recall, my spectrum is a function of frequency. I have one really sharp, long, tall spike, another spike like this, and another spike like this. And this is at 1 hertz, this is at minus 1 hertz. And then out here at 20, I've got some stuff. And then there's more stuff out here. Down here at minus 20, I've got the same sort of thing. Okay, so if I want to reconstruct the original signal, um, it's a sine wave of frequency 1, and you can see that uh, this term and this term in the spectrum are the ones that give me that sine wave. Uh, the middle term is just a large constant offset, so that's actually fairly easy to get rid of once you've uh, gotten rid of all the other stuff out here. I mean, we clearly want to get rid of all this garbage because that's going to interfere with our, with our signal. And so one way to reconstruct this would be to apply an ideal low-pass filter. And so the ideal low-pass filter, in this case, we might go from uh, minus 5 to 5. It would have a magnitude of 1. And again, this is the frequency response of the ideal low-pass filter. So anything inside the pass band gets, uh, un is unchanged because it's multiplied by 1. Anything outside the pass band is just gotten rid of because it's multiplied by zero. So one way to actually implement this in MATLAB would be to go back and uh, take my Fourier transform of uh, the pulse width modulated signal and just set to zero all of the all of the values in the Fourier transform uh, outside of uh, minus 5 to 5. And so let's do that. To do that, I will use a uh, for loop in MATLAB. If you haven't done any programming, uh, don't worry about it. Basically, what I'm going to do, and in fact, I'll plot it as soon as uh, I'm done, is get rid of everything except those three tall spikes in the middle. So that's my goal. We'll see how it works. So we'll go for um, k goes from 1 to 20,001. If the absolute value of f of k is greater than 5, so basically this is any frequency that's larger than 5 hertz, then I will set z sub k equal to 0. Okay, So this basically says if I have a frequency component whose frequency is, is uh, smaller than negative 5 or greater than 5, I just set that to 0. I type an end to end the if statement and an end to end the for loop. And there you have it. So now we should be able to plot here we go, we should be able to plot F, or I'm sorry, the transform, and you can see that um, I seem to have gotten rid of everything. Let's see how much is left. Nope, it's still there. I was afraid I'd gotten rid of the uh, frequency components uh, at plus and minus 1, but they're still there. Okay, so what I've done is I've applied a perfect or an ideal low-pass filter. 
Now I need to take this back to the time domain and see what the reconstructed signal is. And the way I do that is as follows. I will say XH, which stands for X hat, is equal to IFFT. That's the inverse Fourier transform of IFFT shift of um, Z. So what this does is this undoes the FFT shift, which was up there, and then does the inverse Fourier transform. It turns this back into a time domain function. So now if I plot ty and x hat, which I can't type to save my life today, and there you have it. There's my sine wave back. So it turns out if I use an ideal low-pass filter and apply it in such a way that it gets rid of all the extra stuff, I get my, uh, I get my sine wave back. You'll notice that the sine wave is shifted uh, upwards so that it has an average value of 0.5. That's because the uh, pulse width modulated signal actually has an average value of 0.5. Uh, that offset's typically fairly easy to get rid of. Um, I won't talk about how to do that now, but it's not that hard to do. Okay, so this is, uh, again, what would happen if we had an ideal low-pass filter. But now suppose that we want to use a real circuit. So we have a circuit that looks like this. We have a resistor and a capacitor. And let's suppose that this is the pulse width modulated signal. So the idea is that this is a, the voltage generated by the microcontroller or the uh, um, or maybe a power amplifier. I will run it through this circuit and I'll look at the voltage across the capacitor. And the reason I do this is that this is a uh, not particularly good uh, low pass filter. So um, it turns out, as has been described in a previous video, that the frequency response of this filter for particular values of R and C is 1 over J omega plus 2. Okay, so let's look at um, what this H looks like. Let's actually first create it in MATLAB and then plot it. So we go back to MATLAB, and we now say uh, H is equal to 1 divided by um, J times 2 times pi times F, that's omega, omega is 2 pi F, plus 2. And now we can plot F and H. Oh, we want to plot the magnitude of H. And it looks pretty spiky if we zoom in on it. And you see it still looks pretty spiky. If we zoom in even more on it, it looks like this. It has a peak at zero, and by Actually, this probably isn't the best frequency or uh, filter to use because uh, it's already pretty small by the time you get out to one, and it keeps getting smaller. Uh, but it it will do for purposes of illustration. So anyway, this is the magnitude of h of omega. Now, if I go back to my um, uh, drawing here, if I want to get the frequency or the spectrum of my reconstructed signal, I take h of omega and I multiply it by the spectrum of my pulse width modulated signal. Okay, so this is basically uh, all I'm doing here is I've got this low pass filter, in this case it's this crummy one, I'm running x of 
the p pulse width modulated x into this low pass filter and getting x hat out. Okay, that's what it would look like in the time domain. I do that in the frequency domain by just multiplying the frequency response times the Fourier transform of the signal I'm interested in to get this signal. So if we do that, we can do that in this way. First, I need to reconstruct my um, uh, my uh, Fourier transform because uh, I did some filtering on it before and kind of messed it up. So we'll do this one again. Okay, so I've reconstructed my Fourier transform. Now I can say um, say z1 is equal to whoops can't type for some reason today z times h. Okay, and so now if we plot it looks like this. Okay, so this is what the spectrum of the output looks like and you're thinking to yourself, well, that looks a lot better than it did before. If we zoom into it really closely, you can see that we did okay, we still have some other junk out here. Our uh, sine wave uh, components have been somewhat reduced, but it basically looks better than it did. So let's see what happens in the time domain. To do that, again I do x hat is equal to i f f t, i f f t shift, whoops, and then we'll plot x hat again. Whoops, we may or may not plot x hat again. Okay, there we go, we plot x hat. Whoa. I don't think that's what I was hoping to get. I don't know what I've done wrong here, but it certainly doesn't look like what I was expecting to get. Oh, huh. I uh, just screwed that up. Uh, let's try this again. Uh, let's take the inverse transform of Z1, which is the uh, the spectrum of the function after the impulse, or after the low pass filter rather than before it. That's what I did wrong. So it turns out that I just reconstructed the original pulse width, mod or pulse width modulated signal, which is not what I wanted to do. Okay, let's try this. And there you have it. You can see that we have a sine wave, but now the sine wave is kind of uh, raggedy on the tops and bottoms. And if we zoom in on it, you can see that the sine wave looks like this. And what's happening is the capacitor is charging and discharging. And you can see where a pulse is 1, the capacitor charges. Where the pulse is 0, the capacitor discharges. So using this bad filter, this crummy filter, I get a sine wave out, but it turns out to be a little less clean than it was when I used the ideal filter. So um, there you have it. That's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Hopefully this will give you uh, some useful information about how to do these sorts of things in MATLAB. Again, um, the uh, uh, the M file, the function that does the pulse width modulation, uh, there will be a link to it on the uh, Google uh, site page that is a companion to all these videos. So go to the, the and the link to that page is in the uh, description of this video. So that will conclude this video.